You're listening to Trending with Timory, offering an eternal perspective on today's hottest topics. National speaker Timory Millington has been a passionate advocate for life as long as she can remember, helping Gen X through Z answer the call to true feminism and authentic manhood. Timory holds a master's degree in biblical theology, and she covers this week's hottest stories from a Catholic worldview. You're listening to Trending with Timory. So good to be back with all of you. It is my joy to have in studio with me, Dr. Philip Chavez. Always good to be here. Head of the Men's Academy, for those who are not familiar. And we are streaming live for anyone who'd like to join us. We can always find episodes of Trending on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram while they last for those 24 hours. But what I want to talk about today is we're going to be talking about are women, do women belong in combat? Now, some of you may say, okay, well, women already are in combat in some areas. Okay, we can still discuss it. And I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion for a very, very long time. We'll be coming up because there's actually new news in that area. Also, why has there been such a major push for infanticide? And why is it that only in the case of surgical abortion are basic health medical standards being lowered in different federal court cases? Also, what is the difference between limbo and and purgatory and what is the new heaven that we hear discussed so lots coming up on the show also a little bit about justin bieber and his year of abstinence which is pretty cool to check out he was recently married and we'll be talking about tom brady as well and his wife calls herself a good witch what are these rituals that she's talking about in her good witching as we've discussed on trending so dr chavez I want to get into this, and I know some people are going to say, why are you even discussing this? Um, I think this is a topic that people become easily offended over, and that is, do women belong in combat? But let's preface it with this. Recently, a federal court judge just said that basically an all-male draft is unconstitutional. And he said, quote, the time has passed, end quote, for basically the debate over whether or not women belong in the military we shouldn't be having that debate anymore. That's right. Well, there's a presumption here that's uh, been declared that women and men are equally able to fight. Now, again, I would say that's just by declaration. I wouldn't necessarily maintain that's by ability. I think overall men are better able at combat, more apt. In the order of nature, they are stronger. Um, you know, um, when they grow up, war is in their their souls. I mean, To a young boy of three, four, five, every stick is a sword or a spear. (laughs) And so there's something more natural and innate and inherent in a man uh, as a protector, as a combatant. So in in lieu of this, in light of this, rather, um, men are more apt toward combat and therefore should assume those roles. I completely agree with you. And I think that as we sit here and say, no, you know, women should be allowed in all areas of war. Here's where I have more of a problem. There are actually a lot of areas. Yes, while men are more equipped, more um, geared naturally, as you said, even in their soul toward combat, uh, here are some of the problems that we have. When women enter into the battlefield, it really has shown that it challenges men's focus on the battlefield. That's right. If a man has a woman side by side with him, the great compliment is the fact that he, no matter how hard his training is ingrained in him, he still has a desire to protect her. That's and right. so if she's side by side with him and the enemy's coming at them, he's more focused on helping to protect and he's having to fight his natural instinct. Exactly. Yeah. And so so it will it will make him less of a warrior and less focused. And uh, so the mission won't be accomplished. You know, one of the things, Timory, which is vital in war is that it be fought in brotherhood. And so it's when men are together and they fight together in unity um, that they're more effective. In fact, a lot of things are more effective in brotherhood. And so what happens when we put women into the mix, that brotherhood gets dissolved. And so, again, that's a, that's a vital factor for victory in war. Well, and that's so interesting because so many social studies say that, yes, men can have a great time having one woman, maybe two women around in the midst of a bunch of men, but the men are going to behave differently. And it that's right. prevents the type of male camaraderie, male friendship and brotherhood, like you're mentioning, from fully developing. That's right. Interesting you say that. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, when a woman enters a room, men will act differently. You know, they can't be themselves. They can't let their guard down. 
down. They can't do or necessarily what they're normally apt to do. And especially, again, like you say, you know, when the, so in a combat situation, instead of focusing on combat itself, they're focusing on meet, meeting the needs of the women, which they're naturally inclined to do as a protector. And this is something so beautiful. You and I have talked often that even some of the most pro, I can take care of myself, feminist women last year were polled with many different universities behind the study showing that women who wanted to, you know, equal pay, wanted to be treated completely equally, still actually said, no, I want to be cherished. I want to be treated as something different. Well, in order to be treated as something different from men, you have to recognize there's something other. That's right. Well, the bad news is you can't have it both ways, you know? Right. <laughs> so so th- that sense, there's no absolute equality. And in this sense, too, Timur, I think it's important to point out, and I say this in the spirit of the early pontiffs of the 20th century, specifically Pius IX and Pius XI, they thought that women in these kinds of situations, it was a grave violation against their modesty. I mean, first of all, if they're in combat, they're going to be dressing like men. They're going to be looking like men. They're going to be acting like men. And they're in a situation, too, um, you know, in closer uh, circles with men, their modesty and their chastity is going to be compromised. So uh, one interpretation of the church would be for women to be in combat would be a natural compromise of the state of modesty, which she is called to uphold. Well, I could see if people really wanted to argue that women should be in combat, then women should be in only female um, units, essentially, because then it would protect them from many different areas of being a distraction, because not because out of looks, but a distraction out of the desire to protect on the male instinct. I wonder if it's possible, and uh, some of your viewers or listeners may not appreciate this, I wonder if it's possible for women to to assemble in a combat unit and fight on their own. I I wouldn't know if they'd have that kind of, uh, how would I say, aptitudes towards strategy, aptitudes toward implementing what it means to work together as a team, that kind of strategy for victory and war. It's not clear to me that that kind of mentality or that kind of gifting is in a woman. I absolutely think that it is present. I think you're seeing women step up to the plate, for example, in places in the Middle East where many Christian women are actually forming small fighting groups for fighting against the Muslims. Interesting. Yeah, I've been following that carefully. But yeah, it just, it just seems to me just a difficult thing to have women assemble for the sake of defense of the country. And I think that in cases, for example, in the Middle East where women are doing this, it's out of necessity. It's out of dire right. need. I don't think it's where we should be discussing, for example, even in the sense of draft. I mean, here's another perspective I want to throw out there. So we already talked about the distraction, natural instinct of the man to protect the woman out of respect for her and who she is as a woman. But also we've got to remember that in many cases we're seeing that women, there's a high, high rate of abortion among women within military and among service. Because in order to perform, in order to fight and protect the way a man does, she cannot be pregnant. That's right. She has to be on a constant state of hormonal birth control, which many people have even commented within the atmosphere of war actually creates more of a problem because the woman's body, as we've discussed, is in a state of pseudo pregnancy, making her hormones even more altered as if she were pregnant and more hormonal. So then you're placing a very hormonal woman on the battlefield. That's right. And who knows what the uh, uh, actual effects are with the you know, post-traumatic stress that can go with that. And God knows for us men, it's, you know, the hormonal dynamics of a woman's a mystery to us, but it's obvious that that's going to be greatly challenged when she's in a a state of high stress that combat brings. So we're showing that women as they are cannot just naturally engage in combat, but in most cases they have to be on some type of birth control or kill their own children within them in order to achieve their ability to fight like a man, which again, that is now saying that I'm not good as I am. Something has to change, which automatically shows that there's something in our nature and the way our bodies are wired that is not compatible with combat. That's right. And so in virtue of which, because it's not wired, it's in God's province and in God's design, then it's not appropriate that women engage in combat for those reasons. Sure. Another perspective, too, is one of, I mean, unfortunately, the horrific element of war is the fact that 
rape is a major part of warfare. That's right. A major part of warfare. And so the goal is to be protecting women and children. And in this instance, we're actually here saying, like, here, here's an opportunity to ravage and do one of the most atrocious deeds that takes place in war. Yeah, we're going to put them right there on the war, war front. That's right. Or even when they're sharing um, the same ships or vessels, um, you're finding that there's um, much sexual activity amongst uh, the women and the men. Which is actually completely supposed to be off limits, yet when you mix men and women on a ship, on a submarine, in a unit for months upon months at a time, it's natural for feelings and attraction to develop. Yeah, and I think too, um, and it's also in that kind of stress, sexuality will also be seen as some kind of outlet. And so men and they're kind of their, as they will let their guard down, they'll not uh, consider themselves or follow a chase path. I'd be really interested to look at some of the social sciences, but also some of the neuroscience behind this, because we know that on the level of the brain, men and women, um, really neuroscientists are called neurosexists now for pointing out differences. But one of the key differences is that women really connect interpersonally very deeply. And it's the way the brain is wired, making cross back and forth between both sides of the brain. They're able to bring things together and really focus on an individual person, which would really challenge um, decisions being made in combat because that's a gift of the woman to see the person before them. That's right. And and you can imagine, too, just by the proximity, you know, in, in a woman's own emotional state, how they, they, they de- easily develop tractions to men around them, which would be highly distracting. So... Good question. Something that I would love to hear from you guys is whether or not women should be in combat. I know it's controversial. I know it's something that's being allowed, but it's going to be something that is an ongoing conversation. And with this new federal court uh, judge essentially saying that, hey, an all-male draft is unconstitutional, we're looking at the potential, and we have been for a few years now, that your daughters may very well be facing a draft. That's right, and it could be coming. I mean, so long as we want to uphold this absolute equality, that will be next. Coming up, we'll be talking about why is there such a strong push for infanticide. Timory will be right back. Tweet them at Timory. That's T-I-M-M-E-R-I-E. You're listening to Trending with Timory, where morality and culture meet, offering an eternal perspective on today's hottest topics. Coming up later in the show, what is limbo and how is it different from purgatory? Stay tuned for a listener question on that. In the meantime, some of you might be asking, why has there suddenly been such a major push for infanticide? Have you thought about this? What is happening right now in our country? We just saw about less than six months ago this battle um, at the level of the Supreme Court for a new Supreme Court justice. And I said it multiple times on air that the battle came down to the issue of abortion. Dr. Philip Chavez of the Men's Academy is here with me. And I'd love to get just your overall thought. Like when you hear there's such a strong push for infanticide in our culture right now, why why do you think that is? Well, I think it's generally uh, the culmination or rather an ongoing progression of the ongoing disrespect for life. I mean, more and more is it being cheapened and compromised. And so so in some way for, for infanticide or for it to be so permissible or so excused, I think it's just a natural reg- uh, progression of our disrespect, ongoing uh, culture fall for a disrespect for life. You know, as I'm looking at this, Dr. Chava is like, infanticide is has nothing to do with the woman. The baby's already born. Yes. Her health isn't at any risk. That's right. She's already gone through the pregnancy and had the child. Infanticide is strictly about killing a baby. Yet we just saw last night this vote, a 55 to 44 vote, voting down essentially any protection for a baby who's born alive after abortion. So there was trying to be basically bring about medical care that would be given. And in reality, the Republican Party was trying to get the Democrat Party on record showing that this is how pro-abortion we are. We are going to vote for making sure that there's no legal protection Sure. For the baby that's born alive after an abortion, a botched abortion, failed abortion, or maybe an abortion that's meant to take place outside of the womb, which is murder. That's right. So in this case, Timory, it's not about the baby. Um, there, there's a complete disregard for the baby. It's really about a woman's right to continue her life the way she sees fit. And so that 
is a more a higher priority than the babies themselves because they're not look, looking at these facts. They're not really looking at the child. They're looking at uh, the freedom that a woman or maybe a couple or a family or that they can have in society for which a baby would otherwise be an impediment. There's some really great news I want to share in a second. A major shift in public opinion over abortion. We're going to get to that in just a second. But here's the deal. When we talk about infanticide, I was listening to some audio clips of some Democrat senators who were talking about infanticide. And they were saying, this is about women's health care. This is about, um, some people are referring to the Republican Party and our pro-life President Trump as a Hitler for being anti-abortion. And I am just in shock because, in fact, the pro-abortion movement has strong ties to in um, basically eugenics. And that's what infanticide is continuing to participate in. That's right. And and these abortion advocates or these institutions which promote abortion and carry those out, there's a whole, um, not only is it a very profitable trade, but the sale of body parts is also a big end here, too, as well. So, There's real financial reasons for a vested interest for the abortion industry to keep moving forward. Before we come to the striking news in the pro-life movement that I think is cause for celebration, but also cause for the effectiveness of dialogue right now. We'll come to that in a second. But when you think about infanticide, we're forgetting that this is an already born baby that we're talking about killing. Well, the reality is, Dr. Chavez, here in the United States, couples all over the country are waiting years. The average right. wait time, I believe, is about 10 years to an, adopt a child and an infant to that. Yes, yeah, certainly. So what, what's really happening, Timur, you could see the selfishness of the women, first of all, and trying to desire abortion. But that selfishness continues because even if a child is born and it is viable and other couple can take that up, uh, the, the selfishness is so extreme that they won't even allow that gift to be given to somebody else. And, you know, I've actually spoken to many women who are in a crisis pregnancy and I've heard right from their mouths well if I can't raise this child no one's going to and it's so heartbreaking so then you ask the question so are you saying if you can't raise your child this child deserves a death sentence and you know that strikes them because it's logical and they have to sit with that even if they're justifying they have to sit with that fact that someone else can provide a forever home for that child even if you are not capable and or willing that's right and so i i think for some women or if not most it that becomes a lifelong pain that their child is in the hands of another and of course a woman as you know better than i do her her natural instincts are to always be with her child to provide for her child to protect her child to the extent that she does and so to put that child in the hands of another a woman have to live lifelong knowing that they're not fulfilling the natural obligation that which they have You know, when we are talking about this issue of abortion, here's the great news here. This is a major success in the pro-life movement. The Marist Polling, which is a polling center that does an incredible, you know, no sitting here, not sitting here with major bias. They do polling all the time. And this is what they came up with over last month to this month. We've seen a major increase in public opinion over abortion last month. 55% of the country identified as pro-choice just in one month. Now, 47% of the country identifies as pro-life. So right now we're seeing 47 pro-abortion, 47 pro-life. That has dropped from 55% that was saying they were pro-choice. Yeah, and I think what's happening, Tim Marie, is people are starting to dialogue about this more, even when they don't want to. I mean, it's it's a subject of discussion now that, that can't be avoided. And in this case, too, the nice thing is with the growth of technology and all the advancements, and now with, oh gosh, these 3D imaging we get, uh, which we've had for some time now, of, you know, unborn children, it's just stunning. The things that we could see and witness now in the life of the ongoing development of the child. Something I often say here on the show is that we do not, um, we have so many people who are pro-life, yet we're apathetically pro-life. We hold a pro-life position, but we're not willing to speak up or do anything about it. Or that position of, oh, I'm pro-life, but I wouldn't, you know, pressure anyone to sure. you know, keep their baby alive and give them basic, you know, nutrition and the right to um, the woman's body, which it deserves during those nine months. Yet here's the reality. I was just speaking this weekend at a conference up in Fresno, California. And at the beginning of my talk, I was doing a pro-life apologetics talk. I said, by a show of hands, who feels like they can confidently defend their pro-life position? There's about one, maybe two people in there. I said, do we feel uncomfortable 
really defending our position, almost everyone in there nodded their head. They're sure. pro-life, but so many people don't know how to defend it. And I can't tell you, when I present on the issue of abortion, people come back and said, I had no idea we could talk about abortion in this way, that we really are on the side of science, on the side of truth. And I don't have to be that Catholic wacko who's saying the sanctity of human life is That's right. meant to respect and protect human life, not to kill human life. That's right. We could now, with all this technology, we don't need to, theological arguments. We could show just for the nature of things themselves. But I think there's many dynamics here. You know, Timory, I mean, most Catholics, most Christians, I guess we'd say, but as we're Catholics ourselves, I mean, we, we don't even, uh, many don't even know how to defend their faith. Or when it comes to other life issues, uh, seems uh, homosexuality, homosexual acts, uh, things of this nature, and other uh, moral deviancies, I think most people, again, most Catholics, have difficulty defending their faith on those fronts as well. Coming up next week on the show, we're actually going to be talking about this new trend called going no contact. And I think that part of this trend, and this is a little teaser for that, is that a lot of young people, especially millennials, are completely cutting off contact with their parents. And we're going to dive into this, but I think part of the issue, and I'm seeing this among my friends, is they get so frustrated because their parents hold a certain worldview, and they hold it absolutely, but they cannot defend it. And so they're looking at their parents going, okay, you're just an authoritarian parent, so sure. I'm supposed to believe this, but you can't even defend it yourself without maybe name calling and so forth or just saying this is it and i think this is the problem whether it's religion abortion homosexuality we're not defending and looking at both the social science and how it matches what the church teaches that's right and i think one thing too which i thought you were going to allude to earlier timory is that uh when you're when you're speaking is that um you know whenever you're debating or dialoguing you really do have to listen to the other person. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens today in debate now is that, well, especially, I'm not saying professional debate that you may see um, in the media, but I'm talking about debate, common debate we find on the streets. People aren't really listening to each other. I mean, they aren't really giving the sense, I mean, no, even and they may not have a buy into their posi- uh, position of another. Nonetheless, we're in charity. We're supposed to be patient and always supposed to be kind. And I think once that happens, for which I think children are be estranged from their parents, is there's not a real open openness to uh, being received as a child, whether otherwise want to. And I think this is where the Socratic method really does come into play, where you ask questions. Because sure. even if you're asking pointed questions, right? But if you're at least asking questions, you're being forced to listen, or at least you should be. So here's a great, great question to ask. Basically, right now, we're looking at if Roe versus Wade is overturned. So Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton is what really legalized and established abortion across the country and through all nine months of a woman's pregnancy back in 1973. Well, at the time of Roe versus Wade being implemented in Oklahoma, the law that is still on the book, so if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, it would still be there. The law is that essentially to perform an abortion is a felony. That's right. So why not ask friends and family members this? Okay, you say abortion is okay, but why is it that up until 1973 in Oklahoma to kill an unborn baby is a felony? Why is that? Yeah, you know, it's a shame that um, we've been so used to hearing the term and hearing uh, how it's uh, so permitted in society. We've now given in and we've lost the sense that it is a great violation against life and it is a great crime against the child in virtue of which those who aid in a bed or carry out abortion should be convicted for that. I want to do a shout out to everyone listening right now. I will be traveling over the next couple weeks for speaking. So if you're anywhere in or near the Texas area, I'll be speaking in El Paso. I'll be speaking at a conference. We'll be talking about the science of sexuality. We'll be talking about theology of the body. I'm giving a handful of talks during the conference, the Bi-National Pro-Life League yeah. Pro-Family Conference. I'll also be speaking at Knott's Berry Farm in a couple weeks or at their hotel, should I say, on the issue of abortion. And I'll be giving a theology on top very soon and it's some pro-life apologetics right down here in southern california in Great. temecula timory will be right back tweet them at timory that's t-i-m-m-e-r-i-e you're listening to trending with timory Coming up, we'll be talking about Tom Brady and his wife, Giselle, and how she calls herself a good witch. What is that? And also, Justin Bieber has come out talking about how he's lived a year of abstinence prior to his marriage. 
and how it was a part of him overcoming what was truly a sex addiction, as he puts it in his own words. With me is Dr. Philip Chavez of The Men's Academy. You can find out more about his work at themensacademy.org. Dr. Chavez, one of the listeners, David Rodin, asking about what is limbo and what is the new heaven that we hear about in the New Testament. So let's dive into that just a little sure. bit. Yeah, limbo itself. Well, it's uh, it was the theological construct that came along during the church history, which, though, has never really been in any way officially pronounced uh, or defined. It's a place where those young people before the age of reason have uh, have been gone to because they were unbaptized for whatever reason. And so, of course, an abortion becomes an issue because they're they're unbaptized. And so, you know, as we've as the scripture says, we've all been born into Adam. And we must be born again. I thought limbo is the same thing as what we call Abraham's bosom. Abr- so limbo was actually what was prior to Jesus's coming. So limbo was where for anyone who died prior to Jesus coming, because the gates of heaven were closed. For, so for limbo was a place where, for example, anyone who was pure in a st- in ready to go to heaven couldn't go yet because the gates of heaven were not open yet. So limbo is that place of what we also refer to as Abraham's bosom. Actually. That's right. That's right. And so basically it was the, the place where the just would be a holding held. room. That's yeah. right. They, they would be held before they would go to heaven. Exactly. That, that's why we discuss uh, how Jesus went to the dead. He went to the place that's that right. is believed where um, it would be technically limbo or as some people refer to Abraham's bosom. All these just people who died and were ready to be with God. But because of the fall of Adam and Eve, the gates of heaven were closed and it was only the just sacrifice of the beloved son, Jesus Christ, that opened the gates of heaven yet again for those at the time in limbo to enter into heaven. So limbo does not exist anymore. So then there's confusion now because people say, well, what about, let's say, babies, whether they're, as you mentioned, aborted children or maybe infants or children who have are quite innocent before the age of reason, who've never committed a sin That's or right. um, who have never been baptized. Where do these children go when they die? Yeah. And so as the catechism says, you know, we must have hope that they are saved. But uh, again, there's no theological construct this that the church has ever given. But it really stems from that, that these children are somewhat innocent of personal sin. Now they have the effect of original sin on their souls. Now, had Adam not sinned, Adam would have gone to a natural state of happiness. And in some way, um, uh, even a bliss than he would, a greater bliss than he would have even had on earth. But he still would have shared in some kind of happy state. And so, uh, basically, the unborn children are those who have had, hadn't had this uh, this gift of baptism, being able to be born again into Christ. They would also, in some way, not uh, share eternal beatitude, uh, you know, seeing the face of God, but they would share a natural happiness, or a hope that they at least would. It is argued also, if we read in the Catechism, we we come to understand that we in our humanity are bound by the sacraments of God, but God is not bound by his sacraments. And so a child by no knowledge of his or her own was not baptized, whether by parents or because the child was aborted prior to being born. It is really, I think, the conversation very clearly and although not absolutely defined, has always been that we have to remember what the catechism says. We are bound by the sacraments, but God is not. And so in these cases, it is very clearly affirmed that these children are still going to heaven. But here's the thing. These children didn't have the opportunity in life to deepen that relationship with God. And I love one of the teachings where we talk about in the church how your deepness of relationship with God here on earth helps to define the deepness of your relationship with him in heaven. And the more profoundly united we are to him now deepens that unity we have with him in heaven. And so what we're doing is we're denying these children that deeper unity. But at the same time, we are not in heaven. We do not know. And I think that that's the great miracle is that God is not bound by his sacraments. But you and I have that responsibility and we are bound by his that's sacraments. That's right. It's the channel he's chose or the means that he has chose that we are to implement in our lives to not only attain righteousness initially through baptism, but also to be restored through righteousness and grow in righteousness through the other sacraments. 
So, David, you're asking, what is limbo? I hope that helps clear it up. If you have any further questions, let me know. But limbo is no longer a part of where that holding place is because Jesus has come and the gates of heaven are open. However, purgatory is that door where we need to go through the just people and need to go through further purification before being in perfect union with God in heaven. So what is this new heaven, David asks, that we hear about, especially in the New Testament? Well, the new heaven is this. It's not something different, but the new heaven, we talk about how we can have heaven here on earth. The repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Then this is where we're reading about in the Old Testament through the Jewish prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. God's going to do away with our stony hearts and give us natural hearts. He's going to raise our bodies and animate us with his spirit. The new heaven is we can be united with God now that's through right. the gifts of the church and the sacraments, but also that's that perfect union with God in heaven because prior to the fall, it, it, there was a different state of how Adam and Eve were going about their perfection in God. Yeah, that's a beautiful explanation. I like the way you put all that, Timory. It's very profound. You know, basically this new heaven is, is the ability of those who have been baptized and incorporated into Christ to experience deep relationship and communion with, with the Trinity right now. Remember, you know, we're certainly um, heaven is our ultimate destination, but it's also a state, at least heaven being a destination, really is more about a communion with the Trinity, which can be experienced right now. So the, the, the vocation of the Christian is not to act so as to become to is to just simply go to heaven but to live in that state of unity with the trinity right now Mm -hmm. and so the new heaven which which should be it should be part of our lives here on earth exactly of a dynamic interaction of the father son and the holy spirit that's dr philip chavez of the men's academy and it's such a profound reminder what is the new heaven it is the kingdom of god present and that's us daily being transformed by a sacramental life. This is why we look at all seven of the sacraments It and it is the sacrament of union. It's the sacrament of the Eucharist that the church and its tradition teaches is the source and summit of the Christian life. That's right. Because that union, that reception of Christ, we're only supposed to be going to him when we're in a state of grace. That's right. And it's supposed to perfect our nature further and draw us into deeper union, draw us into greater relationship impurity with our friendships around us that's right and and that's what love is isn't it it's not just some fixed state by which two people or two parties enjoy it's something which grows and augments and so the sacraments eucharist especially and and it's through other acts of faith and virtue and other things but the the eucharist is is somewhat of a of a channel of of great grace great sanctifying grace to increase that union with the trinity through which we're called to exercise or to live this or on this earth You're listening to Trending with Tim Ray. Here's another part of this question from a listener, David. David, you ask, well, what about nature and animals? Do you know if, do we have any hint if this will be a part of heaven? This is a great question and a great mystery. But here's the deal. I think this is a perspective we have to have because people say, well, will there be food in heaven? You know, will there be this? Here's the thing. If you get to heaven and you still want any of these things, I'm sure you'll have them. But the reality is, is that we're going so much beyond the material reality. We're going into what's called the beatific vision, which is that perfect union with God to know, love, understand and be present with him. That's right. And that's that's what heaven is about. It's about that beautiful vision we'll see of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit through heaven being not a place which we abide, but it's a state by which we enjoy God and then secondly, enjoy one another. Now, this question comes is is on the third level. What else are we going to enjoy enjoy besides the Trinity? besides one another. Well, to a certain extent, we are too going to enjoy creation. Remember, because we're going to be reconstituted in a body. I'm going to be able to touch you in heaven. I'm going to be able to see you. You will be physical. And of course, we won't just be standing on clouds, right? There Mm. will be an environment around us. Uh, Yes, likely God's nature and God's animals. Now, interestingly enough, I know there's debate on this. An animal intrinsically doesn't have a soul that will last forever. So it's not inherent in an animal like a human being of its potency to live forever because of the type of soul. So it doesn't have a soul which lasts eternity, in eternity. However, for the sake of our enjoyment 
um, there's, yes, that possibility that animals will be with us. And you do make a good point, too, Timber. You know, it's interesting is that you're right. Heaven is a place will be perfectly happy. And if it, if you need your animal to be perfectly happy in heaven, <laughs> then your animal, your pet will be in heaven. <laughs> I think it's a good perspective to have. On the topic, and, you know, you speaking of, you know, nature and how we are participating fully in heaven in sure. all of creation. You know, we look at the um, garden, the Garden of Eden, right? right? And it's supposed to be this cosmic temple. The Garden of Eden is meant to be something very, very beautiful. I mean, if you read in it, some of the language that's not fully interpreted very well into English talks about like all the stones and gems that are present in the garden, and the different types of plants and animals. Yeah. And what this is a reminder of that all of creation, all of nature, the trees, the birds, everything we see now is meant to be a reminder for us that this earth is a cosmic temple. It's a reminder, the whole earth, all of creation, all the greenery around us is something beautiful that in its very existence is worshiping God. That's right. Well said, Timory. And and yes, the and it's supposed to all things, all created reality is supposed to in some way lead us and point us back to God. And you can imagine during the initial days in the garden where Adam dwelt, you know, there was no principle of corruption in anything. So everything shared in a, in a, in a level of perfection that must have been completely and entirely beautiful, both in color, in constitution, in mm-hmm. growth and development. It must have been them all perfectly stunning. It's a great, beautiful teaching of theology of the body, reaffirming that state of original justice, that everything was in right order, right relationship, not just between husband and wife and the relationship between one another of Adam and Eve, but also our understanding and context of nature, our understanding and context with God. And this is what God's bringing us back into with the sacraments. Timory will be right back. Tweet them at Timory. That's T I M M E R I E. You're listening to Trending with Timory, where morality and culture meet, offering an eternal perspective on today's hottest topics. Lots coming up now between Tom Brady, his wife Giselle, and their pregame rituals and outright paganism, as I'll call it. And then we'll also talk about Justin Bieber and his year-long fast from sex, actually, not long before he got married. So Tom Brady, who has more Super Bowl rings than can fit on his hands. That's right. Uh, incredibly talented athlete. He's come out talking. He's actually Catholic. I think he belongs to one of the Catholic, like super Catholic, like large Catholic church communities in Los Angeles area. And it's interesting because this man, he's a contradiction in some ways because he's come out talking about his wife, how his wife is a good witch, as she calls herself. Sure. And she erects altars to him at the football games. And she, you know, is a dabbling in elements of witchcraft and prediction that seem pretty problematic. That's right. And for these things, she's setting up these altars and whatnot using, you know, I guess he wears some kind of necklace and, and there's something he has to drink and who, and I guess they have pictures of their kids. And so there's probably all these other implements she sets up which is again you know ordered toward it you know at the very least a superstition or a practice which is you know certainly not not blessed by god but to to refer to oneself as a good witch well a witch inherently as we customarily know their exploits and they 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 invoke preternatural power for actual the doing of evil and they're invoking the demons exactly now what would want otherwise want to claim in a good witch is that their powers or their enterprise is being used for a good end but the difficulty it's not the good end which defines the act of witchcraft is the powers and the means by which you implement to get the ends which you want to reach. And in this case, they're immoral ends, and it's to implement... I- immoral means. Immoral means, excuse me. Ends. Immoral means, uh, which are implemented actually through the help and assistance of demons to implement, to, to, to accomplish certain ends, which is inherently wrong. So that's a creepy element that we're talking about, and this is being brought up because there's a turn toward increased use of witchcraft in our culture right now. And so as people are like, oh yeah, Giselle, you know, she's predicting whether or not Tom Brady will win the Super Bowl, win the championship. Kind of interesting. Very intriguing. I get it. What I will say is, while what she's participating in is clearly kind of a demonic element that anyone who's participating doing, who's participating in witchcraft. However, I think what Giselle is doing, what her husband Tom Brady is doing is in some ways they're being intentional. They're saying, you know, 
we're, we're talking about our family. We're not, I'm not just winning this for the sake of winning it, but I'm happy to have pictures of my kids present there with me at my game to remind me of why I'm here. It's not just about me. There's something beautiful in that. And I, I've even noticed this in a lot of the um, yoga type of world that even in their classes, they encourage people, you know, set an intention for your exercise. And, and it's similar to the natural idea ingrained in our bodies, not only to worship, but also to self-sacrifice and that so much of the Christian atmosphere um, is oriented toward sacrificial love. I mean, even going to mass, we can offer our mass for someone. We can offer our entire day. You're having a hard time getting out of bed today. Me too. Choose someone to offer the sacrifice of your day for. It's very good, Timur. Yes. And and so things of witchcraft and superstition, in some way they do mimic Christian rites or Christian even sacramentals. And so the act of setting up an altar and all the accoutrements that come with that, yes, it's about something which is to be offered up. So in witchcraft and many many of these superstitious practices, there's there is a grain of truth involved. But again, when um, when directed to the implementation uh, to implement rather the the, the power of uh, the wicked wicked angels is of itself you know gravely wrong and and in the end when you start inviting this wickedness into your life it may help achieve certain ends you wish for but ultimately those angels those wicked angels stay around and they will come back to bite you very hard they think this is a good lesson talking about the story from Tom Brady and his wife Giselle, Giselle and I'm glad they talked about it although it's going to be lead I think some people astray it's a reminder to us Catholics that there is so much depth to Catholicism And we need to share that more. Don't be worried about people thinking, oh, you're weird because you're offering your day to someone or, oh, you're weird because you go to daily mass. You actually go to mass every day. Yes, I go to mass every day. Why would you do that? I mean, talk about this. Talk about God's intercession in your lives, because when you do, it appeals to a deep longing that's naturally there on the human heart. That's right. When we all want to depend on God, and certainly we all want in our in our own lives to stay out of fear. And so when we know God is acting and moving, um, that helps us uh, overcome our fear and to move in peace. And yeah, so, so things of sacrifice and other things we could do, the continual reception of the sacraments, all these things um, bring us to a connection with God, which deep down all people do want. Great news earlier today in the show when I talked about how basically there's been an 8% shift, 8% more people in the United States just since last month are pro-life. It's because of these infanticide bills and so forth. So having those conversations about abortion right now as across the country, states are trying to implement infanticide and New York has this crazy abortion law saying we're keeping it through all nine months of a woman's pregnancy. Now's the time to have a conversation. And here's another one for you. The Supreme Court essentially just voted to block a law in Louisiana that is very similar to the Texas law from just a few years ago that would require that surgeries that are abortion not meet other surgical standards. So they're saying, well, just because it's an abortion, we're not making you meet these standards. Basically, here's a standard that Louisiana was trying to implement for all abortionists. That's that all of the abortion doctors actually had admitting privileges to a hospital within a certain mile radius in case something goes wrong. It essentially would have prevented, I think, their three or four abortionists from being able to practice and drop them down to one. So Planned Parenthood immediately, you know, files, you know, to make sure, no, this can't be implemented. This is just like what happened in Texas. Why is it that only in the case of abortion, we are lowering basic medical standards of care? Well, it just shows you that those abortion advocates see abortion as some kind of right, which is absolute for them. It's not to be compromised for any reason. And so for them to see or to give credence that a surgical procedure has a potential dangers and those potential dangers should be safeguarded and being near a hospital in case something goes wrong is is. Uh, is, is, is a very logical thing. Now, um, yeah, and so in virtue of this, um, it's hard for those to see the logic of that, or maybe they don't even want to see the logic because they're really upholding the absolute uh, right to an abortion. And that's what this is about. That's why they're okay with infanticide. It has nothing to do with the woman. The woman's alive. She's fine. The baby's outside of her, causing no harm. Why are we pro-infanticide? Ask these questions. Why is it only surgical abortions, not other surgeries? We're lowering medical standards. Let's talk about Justin Bieber. That's Dr. Philip Chavez in studio with me of the Men's Academy. You're listening to Trending with Timory. 
I love this. My sister sent it to me a couple weeks ago, and I've been meaning to talk about it here on the show. Justin Bieber, we've talked about him over the years here on Trending and when I was with Trent Horn on Hearts and Minds. Justin Bieber is now living back in line with his Christian faith and, in fact, for a whole year, abstained from sex. Yeah, that's really quite remarkable. You know, and, it, and there's something, you know, as I started to read a little bit more on this, there's something to be ad- admired in him for a few reasons. But I think what he saw, he saw this problem from many angles. I would imagine that in his sex addiction, which he professed, in that addiction, he was probably a very miserable person. One, he probably saw that he was offending women that probably hit him. And then probably something turned for him by which he saw the deep offense against God. And so I would imagine in a spirit of sacrifice, you just mentioned, or a spirit of reparation, he just thought, well, if I at least give this up and offer that up to God, it'll probably leave, probably move him in a better direction, which it did, which he credits the actually the marriage and the union with his present wife to that sacrifice that he had made, as I understand it. I don't know that he would even be open to recognizing the beauty of his wife he has now if he wasn't saying he credits it. As you said, he's now married to Haley Baldwin, daughter of Stephen Baldwin, who's actually quite Christian now, originally grew up Catholic, left the faith early on. And then I think after 9-11 came back into the church, if I remember, or not into the Catholic church, but back into Christianity. Uh, And this is what's interesting about Justin Bieber. He's been in this walk and I mean, he's spoken out as being pro-life, uh, even when it was unpopular, I think, oh gosh, probably about 10, 12 years yeah, ago. Yeah, when he was 16 years of age. Yeah, he was very young, and so he's not, although he's gone off the deep end at times and has danced like an idiot drunk at certain parties, I know that we've given, really kind of reported on him here on the show, it's been neat to follow his journey because he's sw- he's trying so hard, and he's such a testament to anyone who struggled with a pornography or sex addiction, that abstinence and appealing to God in that abstinence, making that sacrifice that truly is a sacrifice when you're addicted to sex, can transform your life. We look at uh, somebody in his position to advocate against abortion and uphold the Christian teaching. I mean, some way, you know, again, in his circles, that's very heroic. That's easy for us to do. It's an easy for thing for a priest to preach against abortion. It's 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 safe for many people, but for him and his industry, that took a lot of courage to stand up. So I can't help but really admire somebody like him who's who's held that position. Now again, he's in a he's in a very dangerous trade. So so being ushered into sex addiction addiction probably wasn't too difficult to do in light of the kind of circles he was walking in. But you could see that the man had some kind of delicate heart. There is something sensitive in him to the things of God and of God's creation. Mm-hmm. And he's been willing to do different interviews over the years talking about, you know, I believe this, but I don't get it. I think he's even lived with certain Protestant pastors at times asking questions. He's had people, I would argue, praying for him, inviting him back into the fold, having conversations. I know there have to be many people, and we've heard even in his own testimony at times, that there have been people there present in his life. And I think that this is a message. There are so many people who are lacking those friendships. And that's where it lies back on us to have that idea of responsibility for other people. That's right. And to express gratitude. I mean, I think he's very, very grateful, which he has expressed that he is in the marriage he is now. And so I think it's, aside from a sacrifice, uh, he's a man who's much gratitude, rather, really appreciates where he's at in life right now. My guest today is Dr. Philip Chavez of the Men's Academy. He actually has a retreat coming up in April for men heading outdoors as well. So you can check that out at themensacademy.org. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Timory. Always a pleasure. If you enjoyed the show, head over to radiotrending.com to catch more episodes that might not be aired on your network or to leave a review and let us know what you think. This has been Trending with Timory. To learn more about Timory Millington, visit timory.com. 